overall it's been really gratifying and it's been really, um, it's strengthening. It uh, gives you a foundation for your personal belief system and it gives you a way to act on it and I've used my own, I'm going to be using my women's studies career for the, or education for the rest of my life so it's really formed who I am and who I'm going to be. It's been a very inclusive uh, program and it's been a, a program that's been welcoming to new ideas. I think it's really important for us to have a women's studies program to make people aware of the fact that there uh, is tremendous benefit to integrating. It's happened. I mean, women are 50, over 50 percent of the workforce and so we have to treat them fairly and encourage women at all levels to develop their potential. We were uh, we here at the University of Delaware were one of the first and most visible women's studies programs when women's studies programs were starting to be established on campuses across the country. It was support more than, than being put down. I think I spent probably an awful lot of time in women's studies that I could have done doing something else. Writing, for example, or um, being on other key committees at the university. But still, I don't think that I paid a high price, and whatever price I may have paid was worth it for that sense of fellowship, which was so powerful, really. Women's Studies itself was created out of this very activist structure. It was um, activist women who began to question why women weren't being included in um, traditional disciplines on college campuses and began to lobby for courses related to women, for changing courses uh, so that they weren't just solely about men, and then ultimately for creating actual academic programs that became women's studies. So we're a, a discipline or an interdiscipline that is a direct outgrowth of the feminist desire to see activism um, put into academic, put into an academic environment. You know, what, what most people looking from the outside would call the low points was what a struggle it was to get it going. For me, it was a high point mm. because the collegiality and the power of the people working together uh, and, and never ever undercutting each other and, and, uh, and none of that bad politics stuff that you got was so wonderful and so heady as I said before and so energizing that the bad point maybe in a way is the good point in some, in some ways. But of course all those, 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 those markers that we got, you know, when we got those jobs upgraded from, from these part-time jobs to real jobs, when we got the major really in, all of those things were exciting for anybody. As I said, when I tell people, my, my, my women friends and colleagues at other universities about Delaware, they'd be awestruck because they were not having those experiences. And I think that uh, it says something for the folks who were uh, in leadership positions early on. That May Carter was given the opportunity to help set up a women's studies program, I think is very reflective of that. I applied for the job and I got the job and I started out part-time and I did educational counseling for women. Now that was uh, helping them get back into school and understanding what they had, you know, what was required. A lot of women at that time had um, interrupted their education to get married and their husband was transferred. At that time it was a DuPont State, a lot of transfers. And so a lot of them wanted to finish their degree. Mm -hmm. But it was hard to get back into college. I imagine that the president who at the time was Art Trabant must have been supportive. Had he not been supportive, this wouldn't have gotten off the ground. Well, that was always a battle. Uh, you know, without May, it would have been very hard. Without Trabant, it would have been hard. I think Art Trabant and May Carter really, really worked hand to glove. They were great friends and great colleagues, and that really worked well. I think it probably means something that the first women courses were taught in continuing education. 
I really do think that means something, you know? Um, and in a way we might look at it and go like, oh, kind of, but it was real. You know, it was about real women wanting to transition into jobs. It was about May Carter's commitment to, you know, white working class women. I think there were, oh, I don't know, maybe 19 or 20 people involved in putting together the first women's studies course. And what we, we did was um, everybody contributed. You know, we, I don't think anybody got paid for it, but we had a little bit of uh, money from the university to develop the course. And we had a good turnout, I think, oh, nearly 100 people that first time. Uh, that was that was hard. Uh, that was hard to coordinate, hard to work. Um, it, it's like the courses you do, some of those one-hour courses. Is everything going to fit? How are we going to get it to fit? Uh, it's such a new area. Um, are we doing the right things in each area? Is this where it's going to go or is it not going to go here? It was, it, was, uh, it was interesting. The other thing that the university offered was the ability to cross-list so that a course I was teaching, if it had enough women's studies content could be cross-listed with women's studies and then a student like you who is not in my department might be take it as women's studies where you might not have taken it as home economics you might not have it might not have fit into your program uh, but if it was cross-listed you could uh, do that. Um, getting support from department chairs to be able to have a faculty member teach a course in women's studies. Now at the time I would bet that all of our courses were cross-listed. We had an introductory course. I think the dean gave us a little bit of money to hire somebody on a course-by-course -course basis. Those were often senior graduate students who would teach that one introductory course. Um, but other than that, we were very dependent on the goodwill of department chairs to allow someone to cross-list a course with us. So I spent a tremendous amount of time as director building the curriculum. But the important part turned out to be the discussion groups after mm. the presentation. I think I remember a fellow from sociology who spoke, a fellow from chemistry maybe, or chemical engineering who spoke, or, um, and they were very well received. And they were very, um, uh, they didn't come in with their suits and ties and, <laughs> you know, they, they were they kind of laid back and they were very well received by the students, mostly women. I don't remember if there were many men in that first women's studies class as students. And of course, you have to understand the students enrolled in these courses and they wanted them. And they would come up and say, you know, change my life. Well, you're not going to give up if it changes their life. It's, it's the, it was that general problem of how to make a structure out of in a situation where administration was not providing resources. <laughs> I, I think the retreat was an excellent idea, and I don't remember whether it was a night, one night or two nights or how long we were there. Um, but Barbara Kelly um, in phys ed um, had us doing exercises in the morning. I mean, it was a it was a faculty gathering such as I don't think any of us had ever seen, and I think maybe more things like that happen now. Um, they certainly happen as options in National Women's Studies Association meetings and so on. But in a way, I think we were kind of inventing a new way to be a community. We came back with a recommendation that there should be a faculty director um, with a full-time professional staff member that they had not had before to help with a lot of the community outreach and programming and things that happen in women's studies that made it at the time very different than academic programs because of the link between scholarship and action that was at the core of women's studies. And so we went to that retreat. I remember it well and fondly. You know, a group of women from very different disciplines, in some cases different backgrounds, thrown together for two days um, to come up with a plan, which we did. It would have been a very difficult thing to sell to the Faculty Senate, I think, 
to create an entire major in women's studies. I think at the time, including Helen Gouldner, thought women's studies was a fad, that it would pass as the women's movement went its way. Um, you know, there was some hostility toward courses. We had very little by way of budget. We had no faculty lines. So we were really piecing something together. And what you do when you're faced with that circumstance is work with the resources you have, um, which could be the existing courses that people were teaching in departments and create an interdisciplinary minor of only six credits that would draw students into your program. And I know I've always thought if you start to build a good program that people want to come to, you know, from that it can grow and develop and get bigger. But there simply would not have been either the resources or political support for a full-blown major at the time. Getting the major um, validated a lot of our uh, students who, who wanted to you know, pursue this this uh, course of study. Oh, it was great. We're in, we've been in a growth spurt, really forever. I mean, we just have grown. It's it's wonderful, and that gives us a capacity to to broaden and deepen our curriculum in some really important ways. This was something that had been in the works for some time because there was student interest, there was faculty support, but this was really a minor in search of a home and it felt that we were the right place and so I accepted it and thought we should do this because, you know, to me there is a, a strong thematic administrative link. In my mind there's a strong thematic and administrative link and, you know, we were the, clearly the right departmental home for that. The grant for the domestic violence is huge institution building for us and I think that puts us on a map in a really important way because it shows a very clear path to a job that is so necessary in our economic climate. State. So far um, we're entering into our third summer and we've already provided over 6,000 hours of services through the internships and through the practicum. And now the students have the consistent training as was developed in partnership between the faculty and the coalition and they bring that consistency to all of the agencies that are generous enough to hope host them. So it's a real exchange. The students can share their knowledge with their supervisors and their co-workers in the agencies. They help the women that they serve ensure that they get connected with the resources that they need. Um, and then they come back to us and they tell us what the real state of the field is and then we can transform our curriculum to address the issues that are of current concern or of particular interest to the students. Um, the minor in um, domestic violence services and prevention. And that I think is really important for us uh, as a department because um, students have such good experiences in that, um, in that uh, well for, for majors it's a concentration, um, in that concentration in terms of their ability to um, really get their feet wet in terms of internships and um, you know, hands-on on work with various uh, community uh, agencies. The fact that, that, that they've had funded summer opportunities, um, you know, whether or not those, that funding will continue, it, you know, really depends on outside forces that are, you know, largely beyond our control. But I think things like that are really important in terms of both maintaining our visibility on campus as well as in the larger community. I do think that for our work, the um, domestic violence, the DV work is going to have a lot of potential and could translate into multiple different avenues. Um, uh, I'm hoping to grow the program so that we're able to offer more internships. Um, so that is clearly an area where I see uh, uh, a lot of um, growth. Actually, that name change sort of happened while I was on sabbatical, but I was very happy to see it, and apparently it was not much of a discussion. It recognizes where the field is, it recognizes what we are doing. So I see it not as in any way a, a tremendously innovative, let alone revolutionary move, but basically acknowledging what has happened in the field and what has happened in our work. And it's, um, you know, it's much more inclusive, and that's the way it ought to be. It's 
provides a breadth of knowledge and experience that other majors simply don't provide because it is multidisciplinary. It's a liberal arts education, and uh, if you want a liberal arts education, it's a, it's a good, I would argue it's a good field. Many of our students come to us to take a required course to fulfill their multicultural requirement, but then because they find our courses exciting, intellectually stimulating, revelatory in terms of history and politics, and so well taught by a committed, pedagogically innovative faculty, they want other courses, they stay, they sign up for more, they become minors, and in some cases, they become majors. To say that I worked in women's studies is, is um, something I'm very, very proud to, to, to say. I think um, it has opened the eyes of so many students to what they should be aware of. Many times they come in not, not knowing anything about women's studies. And when they leave the university, they are a different person because of the courses they took. So I'm proud to say that most students who take a women's studies course were changed by it. That's, that's the beauty of our profession, that I really do think you can make a difference uh, in, in, uh, in teaching at a fundamental level, I think, awareness of issues people have not thought about before because they seem so obvious. So I think that there's ways in which I want students to start to see the world through a lens that is critical of what's around them and not necessarily just take things as face value because as human beings we create our world and we've created systems and structures that sort of set this up and so as long as they're able to stop and evaluate and then say okay this is what I understand given these questions then I think that we are sort of moving forward. It will continue to be relevant as long as there's inequalities in our society, whether that's between women and men or between people of different classes, races. Women's studies applies to more than just women and it will be relevant. It is relevant forever. <laughs> people don't understand how relevant and how important it is until they take a women's studies class. With women's studies, it's, you find like a sense of community when you're here and it's just, it's really nice. And as I really got involved, I just, I'm glad I made this decision. It's the best decision I've ever made.